So let's probe a little deeper into the integrated wise about what God sees. Because that's kind of like the ultimate way to use your spiritual life every day. I've got that on my refrigerator. I don't practice it the way I need to. And I say need to in the sense of it, it would be much more pleasant if I did it. But I'm not in the habit of doing it. Seeing through his eyes. What's in it for God? I ask him that every day. And to be real honest with you, I no sooner ask him the question than I forget about it. I mean, well, when I ask him, I really want to know. But it's like being human is pushing me in another direction. And with my volition, I choose to follow that push. Which means you have to fight against your own humanity to ask the question and find the answer. You're literally swimming upstream against your own humanity. What's in it for God? That's a decent question. That's a desirable question. Forget right, wrong. Forget being moral. Forget being a good person. Isn't it, wouldn't it be nice to know why God enjoyed making this whole story the way it is? Because, you know, it's not pleasant to be human. And how, if it's not pleasant for us, can it be pleasant for him to watch us? And of course, your typical atheist, agnostic, or other petulant person, and we're all like that, okay, wants to say that, well, God gets his rocks off by watching us suffer. You know, it's kind of like in that cute movie, um, what was it called? Rapture Palooza. Okay, where at, at 8 minutes and 40 seconds into the movie, you have a locust on a kitchen floor saying, Suffer! Suffer! Okay, that kind of expresses the viewpoint of a whole lot of people, that God just wants to make us suffer. Well, but that can't be true. Okay, the only people who enjoy watching somebody else suffer are people who are powerless People who are unhappy. How can you be unhappy if you're God? How would you be God if you were unhappy? See, there's two sides of a coin there. If you're God, you can't be unhappy. Because if you were really God, you wouldn't want to be unhappy. And as God, you'd have the power not to be unhappy. Okay, so if you're not unhappy, why would you want to watch anybody suffer. Unhappy people like to have as much misery joining them as possible. Happy people want as many happy people joining them as possible. You get that, don't you? When you're happy, you don't like to see somebody be unhappy. It ruins your own happiness. When you're unhappy, you want everybody to be unhappy like you. So what is the base of that? You want people to be like you are. Where did you get that desire? From God. Because that's how he is. I mean, it's just, it's native to being a person. Whatever you are, you are most attracted to what is most like you. You find attractive things about yourself or not and if you find something about yourself that is unattractive you try to change it but if there's nothing about you that's unattractive then you like it and then anything and anyone else which is like what you are you like that too so if you're a happy person you want everybody to be happy if you're an unhappy person you want everybody to be unhappy Okay, so if you're God, you want everybody to be happy. Because if you're God, you are happy. Doesn't that make sense? Alright, so why is God happy with this design of truth be free when there's so much misery that comes out of it? 
how can God enjoy that? So, you know, how do you find that out? Well, whether or not that were true, just seeing things the way he does would be a lot more enjoyable way to live this life, okay, than just being stuck with yourself. I mean, if you were, if you had to stand in front of a mirror and look at yourself 24-7, that would be a very boring thing to do. It's so much more enjoyable to look at somebody else. And it's so much more enjoyable to look at somebody who's gorgeous. Okay, who can be more gorgeous than God? By definition. I mean, if you were to ask an atheist, okay, you don't believe God exists, atheist. But if God existed, how would God be? What would be the character of a God person if you could, you know, in your wildest dreams, have any God exist that you wanted? What would that God be like? Every single atheist or agnostic will come up with characteristics that in their mind are gorgeous. Because God and gorgeous have to be synonymous terms. Okay, well then if gorgeous, then isn't it more enjoyable to look at somebody who's gorgeous? Especially so you don't have to pay attention to yourself. Because I don't know anybody sane who is pleased with himself as he is. Maybe reasonably content or okay, but generally speaking, if you talk to anybody who's honest, there's something that they would agree that, that, that in their mind they need to fix, that they're not wholly satisfied with themselves. Only a liar will tell you that he's a great person, a liar, an insecure person. A person who's generally somewhat mature and somewhat secure will say, you know what, well, there are a lot of things about myself I'd like to change. Because they don't need to say that they're perfect to feel good about themselves. Because it's not that important if they feel good about themselves. You get that. Okay, so God, by definition, doesn't have anything wrong with them. So then how can he like seeing all this wrong exist? That's the highest plane to aim at. That's the highest plane to live on. That's the highest enjoyment you can get. And it's also the hardest. And it's totally antithetical to being human. What's this like for you, God? What are you getting for this? See through his eyes. That's the ultimate integration. Because once you're on his plane of existence. And he can put you there. Duh, he's omnipotent. Once you're on his plane of existence. And obviously, since you're human, he's only going to dribble out a little bit at a time. But, you know, it's going to last forever, so. A little bit at a time is still a little bit of divine. Still a little bit of God. It's still, like, a little bit of infinitely enjoyable. Versus a lot of not enjoyable at all. Which would you rather have? You see the point? It's more enjoyable way to live, to say, okay, Dad, what's in this for you? What are you getting for this? But your human nature can't, like, focus or concentrate on the answer. That's why you have to keep using, learning and living on Bible, using one John 1 9 as possible, and your concentration, because it's going to be disappointing to you. It's going to last like two seconds, three seconds, five seconds. If it even lasts a minute, that's a long time. Because humans can't do this natively. This is not native to being human. The human, like, what was it? You just threw that at me. So 1 Corinthians 2. The human cannot natively. And what was the other one? Uh, Romans 8, um, what was it? Verses 1 through 10. So, 1 Corinthians 2 and Romans 8, 1 through 10. Romans was written after the book of Corinthians the following year. Paul is saying, that's not native to being human. God has to build the tolerance, the capacity, the dendrites, if you will, the spiritual dendrites. He has to build them in you. And then line by line, Precept by precept, your tolerance and your ability to think about it grows. 
At the same time, because Satan's not stupid, he's going to make sure that your life has a lot of complications in it so that you actually have to pay attention to non-spiritual things at the same time so that you keep on being distracted away from the spiritual question. That's why it becomes ever more important to keep trying to spend time during a day. Just sit down. Be alone with God. Okay? This is in addition to Bible class. In Bible class, you're studying what your pastor says. In Bible class, you're trying to get new information and you know integrate it with your life. But there comes a time, it's just like being with anybody. You want to just be intimate and alone with God. Maybe you have to run to a hotel room to do that. Maybe you have to go out jogging. Maybe you have to sit in the bathroom. Depending on your circumstances. To get that quality alone time with God. And maybe you only got 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Maybe you could do it while you're in an elevator. The more often you do it, the easier it becomes to do. So that you get to a point where you can be standing in line at the airport. And be just thinking toward Him. It really, it's, a, it's really a very helpful thing once you get into the habit of it. I've got, it's happened to me a lot in grocery lines. You know, I have to stand waiting at the grocery line because there are people in front of me in the conveyor belt and I got my shopping cart and blah, blah, blah. It, it gets real easy to think about him then because I've done it so much. To practice like piano, okay? That's about the only way you can get that skill. Because you're voting, voting, voting to do it. And you yourself don't have the strength to do it. He has to provide it. But he builds it slowly, line on line, precept on precept. Once he does that, it becomes like breathing. Okay? But even when it's like breathing, breathing is a short. <gasps> okay? So it's only for moments. But if you do it often enough, it's kind of like what he does to me while I'm talking in these audios. He, he throws something at you. Like I'll be watching TV or writing an email or making something, and I'm not thinking about him at all. And in the very middle of it, he just throws a thought at me that's connected to what I'm doing, what I'm watching, what I'm typing. Just like when I'm talking in these audios. This didn't used to happen. It's only been happening in the last couple of years when I've been talking on these audios in the God Deed series. He just throws something at me while I'm in the middle of talking. And he'll do that to you too. Watch him do it. He will do it. Okay? Sometimes the, the demon boys do it too. You know, because they're nothing if not competitive. But but just, you know, if the demon boys are doing it, you'll know. And it's like, oh, the demon boys brought up this thing. And Dad, what do you think of that? See, when they bring up something, it's an opportunity for you to ask Dad. Because even when the demon boys are talking to you, it's Bible class. So then you ask Dad about it, or as I like to call him, Mom, the Holy Spirit, because he likes to call himself a mother hen in, in Genesis 1-2, Hebrew verb Rahaf. Okay, so so there you are. What do you see, Dad, when I'm sitting on the toilet? What do you see when I'm watching the political news or a political debate or the you know, traffic going by? What does it look like to you? The more often you ask that question, each time that's laying ground cable, so to speak, that's like laying fiber optic cable in your soul. That's permission for God to build dendrites so that he can flow information to answer the question. That's not only true with that question. It's true with any question you ask him. So that you get that fiber optic spiritual highway built between God and you. And then you start to really see through his eyes. And like I said, after enough practice doing it, he starts throwing stuff at you. Even when you're not asking him. Because essentially you have asked him. You've given permission. You do want it. You do vote. And hopefully you're praying for yourself and everybody else 
for that to occur. So that's carte blanche blanket proxy vote. So then you can throw it down the highway. Then you start to, as a ruler, see what it's for, what is he like about being God. Because frankly, that's the more you come to understand him, the harder it is to understand why being God is an enjoyable thing. I have a lot of trouble with it anyway. You know, a lot of people, and I don't understand this, a lot of people think that winning and being number one and and being better than others and having control over others is somehow a wonderful thing. I've never understood that. To this day, I still don't. What's the value of winning? Seriously. Okay, you're number one. Now you're standing on the mountain, all right? And you're better than everyone else. What, what, is that, what does that win you? What do you get for that? Just beating them? How is that enjoyable? I've never, to this day, I still don't understand what's, you know, the thrill of that. Oh, I'm victorious. Okay. I mean, to me, the winning doesn't mean anything. It's the intrinsic value of what you got. That I can, I can relate to. But the sheer fact of just winning for its own sake... That I don't get. I'm not saying it's wrong. Obviously, God places a value on that because he talks about it a lot in the Bible. You know, like, nakao is a very important verse, you know, v- verb in the Bible. Nakao means to win, to conquer. And he uses it a lot in Revelation. John uses it in First John. So it's, it, it's you know, it's... It's not wrong to have that motive. I just don't see the value of conquering. I see the value of you can have something you don't have, so you go after it and get the thing you don't have. I see that. But the winning of it, I don't get that. Now, seeing things through God's eyes, it's going to have to be said that He does enjoy the actual conquering, the actual winning. And maybe men understand that better than women do. I don't know. I don't know if it's a fault of mine from being female or just a fault of mine in my character. But I don't see the value of winning something. I see the value of getting something I want that I don't have. But the winning of it, I don't see any value to that. Okay? Maybe you do. So if you do, then you can relate to that in God because surely it's in Him because He talks about it. Or, if there's something else about him that you can relate to, then you see that. Now, what does that do? That helps you see him. That also changes your own motive for what you pursue in life to be more like his. So, if you can tie into the winning part of it, then that motive gets added to your repertoire of motives. The tide is. So now when you go to do something, instead of doing it for your typical human motives, it's the God motive. Because it's His motive. If it's His motive, then it's for His reason. And it's got to be the highest plateau, the highest plane of existence that a human, well, not even a human, that a person can be on. Because if it's his motive, that's ultimate, right? So then wouldn't that also argue, therefore, if you're using, if you're, if you're run by, or you're, you're living on his own motives because you agree with them, then wouldn't your happiness be on the highest plane too? And wouldn't you then know what he meant by saying ye are gods in Psalm 82 verse 6 and also John 10 34 where Christ is updating it 
Because, you know, he's God, man. He's making a play on it there. Higher in me. I die for your sins. Therefore, you're in me on the cross. Therefore, after the cross, you'll be in me and therefore have my level potential that you can sp spiritually mature to. Well, who wouldn't want that? Forget about right wrong. We're talking about intrinsic value and advantages and disadvantages and higher planes of having, of living. You know, nobody wants to live amongst rats and cockroaches. We would all like to live on the highest plane possible. And a lot of people equate material wealth with being a higher plane. It isn't necessarily, but pretend it were. Okay, what about the highest plane of thinking? The richest thinking. Well, who's richer than God? See? True riches, Christ called it. Yeah, look why. And then you know what it's like to be God and why he likes this. And why does he like it? And what, what really gets his rocks off that he wanted to design this? First thing, truth is free. He ain't gerrymandering. God is omnipotent, but this he didn't create. It freely happens of its own. And as it were, he chooses to ensure its freedom and its existence. And he does, but he doesn't, how do you want to call it? Cause it. He chooses to subordinate himself to the truth. That's Psalm 138 too. And he chooses for truth to be free. And he will kill himself, as it were, to keep it free, and then all the causes, conditions, successions, and relations for which he determined a certain futurition occur. And he didn't cause that. He ensured it, but he didn't cause it. That's a thrill to him. Now, if you're not rich, you might not understand that motive. If you know anybody who's rich, or you are rich, you should understand that motive. A thing, when a person is rich or you have everything, what matters to you the most is honesty, freedom, something that's true, something that's genuine, something that to you is priceless because it cannot be bought. That's what matters to a rich person. They care about free. I don't mean free isn't costless. I don't mean free like they don't expend anything for it, but free like in real. Free like in genuine. Free like in unencumbered. So and so really loves you, and it doesn't have anything to do with all of your goodies. And it's not that the ego needs that. It's the enjoyment of it being free and real for itself. And we all have that motive. You love it when you might even give somebody something and you can see that they really just enjoy it. They're not being nice. They're not being greedy, they appreciate it for itself. And they're genuinely happy and grateful and enjoying it for itself. And there's no sense of obligation, there's no sense of feeling guilty, it's just pure enjoyment, free. And you've had that enjoyment yourself of things that somebody gave you, or maybe you bought it for yourself. But it's totally unencumbered. That's the way God enjoys it. That's one of the biggest things he gets out of it. It's free. It happened of its own. I insured it, but I didn't cause it. 
It's free. And when you or I, and I, this is hard for me to come to grips with, but I know that it's true, so I'm just going to say it. When you or I believe in Christ, when we choose to learn and live on Bible, even if it's only for a second or two, that's really our choice. Yeah, God ensures it. Yeah, God enables it. But He didn't cause it. Okay? He didn't cause it. I really wanted to know the, the Bible. That's not meritorious in me. But it is true I wanted it. God didn't cause me to want it. He enabled me to want it. He enabled me to understand it. And then once I understand it, I am saying yes or no. That's not meritorious. The merit is in the object. That's why I'm saying yes. Oh God, you're gorgeous. Yes, I want you. Of course I want you. That's him being gorgeous. And he knows that. But he didn't cause me to say yes. At my end, I'm looking at him like, well, why wouldn't I say yes? Because he's gorgeous. I want him. Yes. Of course. Yes. And I, can, I count myself blessed that I get to know him and I really am. All those things are true too. But to him, he's like, she wants me. Now, I don't know how many rich people you know or people that maybe you consider attractive in some way due to their what they own or what they are or whatever. But anybody who admires or not even admires when somebody likes you and is pleased by what you do or say, there is a certain element of, wow, Surprise, especially if you're an objective person. It's not that you don't know that what you did was good, but when you did it, you did it because it was good. It was good. You weren't really expecting somebody to like it. You were hoping for it, but you weren't really expecting it. So when you get it, it's something of a surprise, and it's a definite pleasure. Because you feel kind of privileged that you were able to do a good thing. And so if somebody likes it too, well that's extra. That's how God thinks. So that's why it says, I mean, what was that verse? Well, the angels crane to look. Uh, the Peter verse, angels long to look is how it's translated in English. I don't remember the Greek. It's, I want to say it's in Second Peter. Into such things, angels long to look. Um, and then what was the other one? I can't. Really, uh, I can't remember. That's my arrogance, Dad. What was it? That was the verse. Okay. Um, the idea being that the angels are also thrilled when they see us believe in him. The verse, yeah, that was it. The verse about how when one believer turns to Christ, the angels are cheering in heaven. Okay? When any believer believes in Christ, the angels are cheering in heaven. That's in the Gospels. Christ talked about that. Alright, it said it more and more than one occasion. Alright, so, you know... If the angels are thrilled when we believe in him, that's a thrill to them. Then you can start to understand, well, then it must be a thrill to God. Why? Because it's just inherently pleasurable. See, that's the point. Is the more you start seeing through his eyes, the more you learn what real pleasure is. God isn't sinning because he doesn't like it. It's not attractive to him. Nothing can make God sin because he sees it for what it really is. And, you know, it's kind of like gasoline. Ew. Who would want to do that? God didn't want to sin because it's not attractive to him. 
And once we're dead, we won't want to either. Okay, so the sooner you can start asking the question to God, well, what does this look like to you? Why do you like it? The higher your spiritual life will go, will, will become faster, sooner. If you can try to sort of make that a habit, God remind me to ask you this question. What is it? What's in it for you? What do you see out of this, Dad? How do I see through your eyes? And you'll forget as soon as you ask. But keep asking and ask him to remind you to ask. And then you're going to start seeing. Because it really ramps up the spiritual life. And really of all the reasons why you should ever even want to be a Christian. This is number one. This is the real joy of it. To see what he sees. To enjoy it the way he does. That What was that? Romans 12 too. He just threw that at me. Christ enjoyed the cross. That's what that verse says. That verse is not there to make us feel guilty about Christ being on the cross. It's there to say, look, it's happiness is so great, I even enjoyed the cross. I'd like to know what that's like. I want to know how to enjoy suffering. How do you enjoy suffering without it being masochism? Because Satan's accusing God of being masochistic and sadistic. How do you enjoy suffering? Well, if you stop to think about it, there are a whole lot of things in this world right now that you do that are suffering that you actually do enjoy. Most people will tell you that they enjoy sexual intercourse. But there's a whole lot of effort that goes into that. Yet they enjoy it. Most people will tell you that they enjoy eating, food, dance, sports, even work. Okay, but there's a whole lot of effort that goes into all of that. So now ramp up the same idea. At God's level, there's a a total effort. In fact, I mean, he committed himself to it. Why did he create? He must enjoy all that effort. How come? Keep asking him. And then you'll start to see through his eyes. And then you'll be on the highest plane you keep on aiming at. It's like shooting basketball. You know? You keep aiming at the at the basket. And you hit it. Or you miss it. Okay, but you keep aiming. You'll get better. Keep asking, what, what is in this for you? See what happens. Use one John 9, ask that. What's in it for you? Why do you enjoy this as God? What's the value of being God? See what he does. Peace out.